polynomials take the form p of x, which is going to be a function. And then they have coefficients. And then they have different powers of x. Let me say this is written in descending order. We define n to be a natural number, so that means it's a number like 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's a whole number, and it's one of the ones that we can use to count. And then we've also talked back in chapter, and then we've also talked about how polynomials have different degrees. And so if this is written in descending order, then our degree n is going to be our highest power of x. I also give you this definition. We call a number r. And that number r would be if we plugged in r and replaced all the x's in our equation up here with r's, and we got 0 as our answer, because that's not going to be normal. If I picked any x in the world, I'd get all sorts of different answers. But if I pick r, and if r ends up giving me 0, this is called a 0 of the polynomial. Sometimes we call these a roots. If we were back um, thinking in some of the previous stuff we've done on graphing curves, then we would consider r to be an x-intercept of our function, p of x. So, in general, we're not just interested in talking about functions and curves and finding these, these x-intercepts, but in particular, p of r is going to equal 0 if and only if. And if and only if is one of these mathematical words that sort of comes out every so often. I think now's about the time when it comes out in this kind of level. And it means that this left side here is going to be true only if the right side is going to be true. And if the right side's true, then the left side's automatically true as well. It's like equal things that you can swap out for each other. So if I have a zero of the polynomial here on the left side, then on the right side, I know I can take my polynomial p of x and I can divide it by the factor x minus r. And this will give me a new polynomial. A new polynomial that follows all of our rules, except my new polynomial is going to have degree of q of x is going to be n minus 1. It's going to be one level smaller than whatever my original polynomial was. So if I have the right side, then I get the left side's true for free. If I've got the left side's true, then I know the right side's true as well. In fact, we can rewrite the right side and say that we've factored our polynomial p into smaller pieces. One piece that involves my factor x minus r, and the other piece that involves my new polynomial that's one degree smaller than the p of x was before. Notice a couple things. This is a positive r. This is a negative r. There's a sign change here. That's expected. And now we have our factors. Now I'm not going to talk about this and then go and do polynomial long division like this might suggest. That would be a good way to take a perfectly fine day that I've been having and turn it into a perfectly horrid day. Instead, we're going to talk about something called synthetic division. Synthetic division is a shortcut to long division. So rather than write up our big long polynomial and do some sort of big huge p of x and dividing it by an x minus r and getting our q of x here, that seems tricky and complicated. So instead, we're going to talk about some other stuff. What is our overall goal? Well, our overall goal in this module is to find r. I don't know exactly how to say this, but we want p of r equal to 0. That's what we want. If I pick random numbers that aren't r, let's say I pick a number s, p of s equals blank. It's going to equal some number. We don't know what it's going to be. We'd like to be able to figure out what that is, and maybe if I can figure out some nice way to evaluate polynomials for particular numbers, this might lead us into some insight into how to solve them for zero.
Now, of course, we could always go back into a polynomial and replace every s, x, with an s, or any particular number we wanted to, and we could solve that out. But that takes a little while, and it won't build up the framework we need to force a solution to zero. And if you think way back into some previous algebra you might have done, there's no nice way to factor this. Maybe this one down here actually does happen to uh, factor by grouping. But in general, for random powers of x, factoring is tricky. Factoring is difficult. That's not just true in this particular class as a general human condition. Factoring tends to be just a little bit tricky. So let's look at my first example here. I've got 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x plus 3. Now let's look at part A, where I think I'd like to figure out what p of 3 is. We'll figure out some answer for him in a second. And then after we've done that, we're going to come back over here to part B, and I'm going to pick a very particular number for us to find a 0 for. So here we will find... of r equals zero. Now when I say find, be very careful. I'm kind of lying to you right now. By find, I mean I'm going to give you something. You're going to convince yourself and me that it's true, that it gives you zero. We're not quite ready to find it yet, even though that is part of our big goal. We want to find these. That's our, our overall purpose for studying this stuff. So I want to talk to you about how synthetic division works. Synthetic division is very much a, a plug-and-play sort of process, so check it out. We want to find out what p of 3 is. Here's what we do. First of all, notice the coefficients. This is all written in descending powers of x, x cubed, x squared, x, and no x's. So I have 2, 3, 2, 3. In synthetic division, we do have our little division shape, just like we're used to with long division, but we turn it upside down. And since we've turned that division upside down, we're not going to have x minus r. We're not going to have an x minus 3. Instead, we're going to just have a positive 3. Again, this comes from that if and only if statement where I asked you earlier to make sure you watched out for the sign change. So we want to find out what p of 3 is equal, so I put a 3 here. Then you always go to the very, very last number at the end and you draw a little line through it like this. So we had 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3. And that's where we got them. And that very last 3, I draw this little bar. Whatever is over here is going to be our remainder. If you think back to long division in grade school, we talked about remainders. So here's how synthetic division works. Notice I don't have polynomials, I've just got numbers, so that's why it's called synthetic. It's nice and easy. I pull this 2 down, and I write the 2 here. Whatever is in this first column, you always pull it down and write it there. I'm going to give you about three examples of synthetic division, and I think you'll get a good feel for the pattern by then. I pull the 2 down. Next, I take 3 times 2. 3 times 2 gives me 6, and I write it in the second column. I add these together, and 6 plus 3 gives me 9. Then I take 9 and I multiply it by 3. So 9 times 3 gives me 27. So notice my pattern. I take a number, I add whatever's in the column below it down, that first one we always add 0 to it, and I take whatever that answer is and I multiply it by 3. So you pull the 2 down, 3 times 2 gives me 6. Add 6 and 3 together, that gets you 9. Multiply the 9 times the 3, that gives you 27. I'm going to add 27 and 2 together to get 29. Take that answer and multiply it by 3, and that gives me 87. 87 plus 3 gives me 90. This 90 right here, which is my remainder, is also my answer for what p of 3 is equal to. So I now know that p of 3 equals 90. You could have taken 3 and plugged it in for x, because p of 3 also equals 2 times 3 cubed plus 3 times 3 squared plus 2 times 3 plus 3. If you solve that out, you'd eventually get 90 as well. But we don't want to do it this way, because this way doesn't let us find factors. And synthetic division is going to be a lot quicker. Because notice, we never had to deal with all that big of a number at any particular time. We're just multiplying and adding. All right. So for random numbers that the book gives you, 
perfectly fine. Plug in the number, watch the signs. And what this means is that x minus 3 is not a factor of my polynomial p of x because we had a remainder. It wasn't a perfect division. If it was a factor, after we did the division, we would have had a perfect polynomial left over with no remainder. And that simply didn't happen. So now let's find one where we do have p of r equals 0. And right now we don't know how to find r yet, so I have to tell you what r is. We're going to try r is equal to negative 3 halves. Now there's no reason you should know that r is 3 halves. I'm just giving it to you for free. But we take our synthetic division, we do it like we did before. We take 2, 3, 2, 3, and I'm going to divide it by our r, which is negative 3 halves. Get my dividing line here, pull my 2 down, multiply 2 times 3 halves. The 2's cancel, and this leaves me with negative 3. If that didn't make sense, it's time to review some fraction addition. 3 minus 3 gives me 0, and a fraction times 0 leaves me with 0. 2 plus 0 is 2. Negative 3 halves times 2, the 2's cancel. I'm left with a negative 3. I get myself a 0 here. Because I have a 0 in this very last spot, there's no remainder. That means that p of negative 3 halves equals 0. So that means negative 3 halves is a factor. Negative 3 halves is going to be a root. And that's all very nice and cool. But I should also be able to take this division process and turn it into a factor term and a polynomial that's one degree smaller than my original. My original polynomial was a cube. So what I should get is my original polynomial of 2x cubed plus 3x squared plus 2x plus 3. And it should factor out into these pieces, the piece x plus 3 halves. Remember in the factors, go back up here, whatever your factor was, it's going to have the opposite sign of your r term. Here the r was positive, so our factor was x minus r. But down below here, my r was negative, so my factor term is going to be a positive in between there. And then I'm going to have times the remaining piece. Remember the remaining piece of our polynomial should be one degree smaller than our original polynomial, which was this cube. I take this 2 and I put it in front of the x squared. That's one degree smaller. Then I do plus 0 in front of just an x, but that doesn't mean anything, so I don't write it down. And finally I have plus 2. I've taken a cube and I've factored it into two pieces. Think back to how we were factoring quadratic equations. So think back to factoring. Maybe even pause this video and watch it again and realize what a big awesome thing has happened here by taking these numbers and being able to factor them once I found a zero. To emphasize how cool it is, because of course this polynomial up here, we could have done factor by grouping. This would have worked by grouping. That's not actually all that new or powerful. It's nice to see that the math works, but let's take something that there's no way we could factor by grouping. This one just won't work. It has no real common term. But it is a polynomial. It is written in descending powers, so let's try it. Now here's something that to think about. If I tell you that x minus radical pi is a factor, then you'll come back and tell me, sure, it's a factor. Because p of radical pi equals 0. That makes sense. And then if I said, how would we check? How would we check? Well, you'd say, we'll check it with synthetic division. In synthetic division, you wait till your polynomial is written in descending order, which this is. And so we write it 6, 19, 10 minus 6 pi. That's kind of a long term there, but it's still one single section in front of the x squared. Minus 19 pi and minus 10 pi. 
We draw our upside down division sign. We block off that piece at the end for the remainder. And whatever my factor term is, I change the sign when I'm ready to do my synthetic division. And now we go through the synthetic division process. I pull the 6 down. I multiply 6 times root pi, and I get 6 root pi. These are not like terms, so when I add them together, I get myself 19 plus 6 root pi. I take 19 plus 6 root pi, and I multiply it by root pi. That gets me 19 root pi when I distribute plus 6, and root pi times root pi leaves me with pi. That makes these two be opposite signs, so they cancel. And I'm left with 10 plus 19 root pi. Take my answer and I multiply it by root pi. This leaves me with 10 root pi plus 19, and then root pi times root pi again leaves me with pi. Just like root 2 times root 2 is going to leave me with 2. The 19 and negative 19 pi's cancel. I'm left with 10 root pi. I take my answer and multiply that by root pi. That gets me positive 10 pi. These add together and give me 0. So just like you said, since I told you x minus radical pi was a factor, you knew that meant we were going to get a remainder of 0. This was our check. And this means that we've now managed to factor a fourth degree polynomial into a polynomial that has x minus radical pi. This guy's a factor. And then my remaining piece, since I started off with a fourth degree polynomial, should be a third degree polynomial. And it's going to have coefficient 6x cubed plus 19 plus 6 root pi x squared plus 10 plus 19 root pi x. And you know what the last term is. It's plus 10 radical pi. So I multiply these together, distributed this terms throughout, I get myself back up to my second example here of a polynomial. So what have we done? Well, we use the remainder theorem to say that polynomials take on the form p of a n, x to the n, so we have all these coefficients and all these descending powers of x, and n is a natural number, and this is the degree of my polynomial. And what the remainder and factor theorem say is that if I have an r, and it's the type of r that if I plug it into my polynomial, I get 0, we call that r a 0 of the polynomial. Sometimes we call that r a root of the polynomial. If we were to graph our polynomial, r would be an x-intercept. And then we have our very interesting theorem here, which says, look, if I have a root, if I have a 0, that can happen only when the factor built from that root perfectly divides my polynomial. And that's nice because this gives me a method for factoring polynomials, because I take something that's degree n, and I turn it into something that's a degree 1 polynomial and a degree n minus 1 polynomial. This factor didn't seem all that big and impressive when we were factoring something that we already knew how to factor. But when you're dealing with some random polynomial that you've been given, like this one that has some pretty nasty terms in it, this factor theorem is going to be pretty useful. So now what are we left with? Well, you need to master synthetic division. I've given you some examples, but we're dealing with that. You want to figure out in your head and clarify very clearly what the relationship is between roots, zeros, and factors. We've mentioned, look, roots and factors have this nice if and only if relationship between them. So that's what you want to focus on and make sure that starts to make sense. Otherwise, this module is going to be pretty tricky. And then things to be thinking about for the future. And this is a big trick in math. You can think about where you're going to go. It can make where you are have a place to live sort of puts you in home instead of lost out in the wilderness. How did, in this problem, how did I know to pick radical pi? How did I know that would end up being a zero? How did I know I was going to get this zero remainder here when I first told you at the start of this that, look, I'm promising you that x minus radical pi is a factor.
it worked out okay for us, but I shouldn't have to guess. There should be a way to know this. And that's going to be the next section.